are back, Charles. We are trucking and we are making the cinematographer chat happen. <laughs> what do you think? How do you feel? I mean, we don't we put all these out and we don't know if the people are gonna respond or not, you know? I know we're in part three. I don't even know if we've told them before that there are four parts. This isn't gonna go on for a hundred parts. It's only four. Four parts. Right. So it's just, you know, the, just this month is a, it's a month of cinematography chat with uh, Andy and Adrian, and we hope you're enjoying it. Uh, and uh, we, we love both of these guys. And uh, I probably should have mentioned that uh, the I, I had Adrian as the DP for the show Play by Play season one. And then Andy took over and did seasons two and three. And you can watch all three of those seasons right now on Roku channel. I don't know how much longer it's going to be on there, but it's been on there for a year or so now. And so if you have Roku channel or access to Roku channel, you should uh, check out the show play by play. I directed the pilot and I directed uh, about almost half, maybe half the episodes of the entire series, so about half from each season. But uh, Adrian shot the whole first season and Andy did two and three. And so check them out if you have the the chance. It's kind of a fun. It's interesting to look at the differences. I don't know if you've I don't think you've had the chance to watch those, Drew. But like the 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 look of season one is different from seasons two and three. And you can kind of see the preferences of how Adrian likes to to light and shoot and how Andy likes to light. Maybe it's more oh. the lighting than anything. Interesting. Yeah. And, and Adrian shot uh, Night Owls, which is now on HBO Max as well. Your feature. Yes, of course. Yeah, check out Night Owls. It's on HBO Max, and it's also on demand on uh, DirecTV and uh, Spectrum. And uh, yeah, um, I think that's about all I've got. Uh, do you want to do your uh, favorite part of the show? Yeah, I'm going to do my shout-outs right now. I first want to give a shout-out to Jeremy Dillon and his podcast, My Favorite Album, where each week he talks to a different singer, songwriter, musician, filmmaker about the music they love and how it's influenced them and their work. Also want to give a shout out to John B. And another shout out to Elvis Ripley. So that's it. I think we should just get on with it, right? Yeah, let's get into it. Okay, we'll be back afterwards. Well, I think that photographically, I think five, I think Rogue Nation harkens back a little bit more to one, actually, for me. Because I think... Oh, interesting. Because I think there's a kind of style and there's a certain kind of, like, uh, grandeur to a lot of that, uh, to Ellsworth's lighting and photography that feels very classicist, but feels... I mean, they even talk about, like, the whole leg slit dress moment, her walking up the steps and that leg... Like, there's very, like, sculpted kind of, like shots and, and kind of lighting in that film, whereas I think Ghost Protocol is a little bit looser. I think it's a little bit more akin to to three. But the camera, I think, is a little bit more expressive and inventive in four than it is in five. Maybe that's the nature of Bird, as opposed to Macquarie. You know, so I think those are the, the true handoffs for me between between those two movies for me. And like and like that's the thing. It's like again, it's like about like an an older photographer cinematographer, not old in a bad way, but just like a classicist in many ways, like Ellswood kind of embraces. He's, he's, Ellswood's interesting to me because like he's kind of like, he's a classic cinematographer in many ways, but he's also like straddling the lines between modernism until you get to like fall, uh, Fallout, which to me is like, is like the, 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 the kind of postmodern take on film noir and a lot of cinematography techniques as opposed to the first film, which is almost decidedly classic in terms of the way it uses light and, and, and composition and, and, and shot structure. So, I mean, the, 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 the bracketing of those two movies, of Fallout and the first one, are really, the contrast is really incredible. Well, let's go to Fallout. What do you, what do you mean by modernist uh, photography? Well, it's like a lot of guys from like shooting modern, they, they, they like spaces. You know, and that's what I always feel in, in Fallout is like all these spaces have a really kind of like lit presence as opposed to the to, to light on faces. Like like as opposed to subjects being lit, it's more about like the the environments. So there's a certain naturalism, but it's almost like a uh, it's almost like a like a low key naturalism. You know, like uh, I think there's a lot of things that feel more like the Godfather, frankly, in uh, in Fallout. Than than, uh, than anything close in to like the first one, just the, the way just the way the first the whole uranium the whole that whole first bit going down like that. There's hardly any hard light. It feels like it's all soft light and deep shadows and kind of soft light on faces. 
there's a really kind of modern film noir aesthetic to, to Fallout that I find really fascinating. And it's beautifully lit. I mean, it's... Yeah, there's almost like, there's like lights where there shouldn't be. And then other things that should be lit are completely dark. I remember thinking, and I think Charles and I, I'm sure, discussed this after we, we saw it for the first time, but just how unusual that kind of like lighting structure or whatever decisions that were being made were were very different yeah. in that movie. Yeah, like I mean, comparing one to Fallout, like one, the the faces are so lit. The entire face, everything is so lit. It's that old kind of classical feeling Hollywood lighting, and you get to Fallout, and one half of somebody's face is com almost completely in darkness. There's right. no fill light on the edge of their head or anything like that. You can't really see, or not a ton of edge lighting or a ton of backlighting. Like it's more about faces and then like environments. It's really a, it's a fascinating look. To me, it's the, the biggest outlier photographically in the series to me. Fallout is, you're saying. Yeah. It's, it's fat. I, I, man, I really, I could listen to, to you guys talking about this for ages because I was fascinated by the difference that, you know, I'm lumping four and five together and then six because I, the Ellswit, that type of photography, like you, like Adrian said, like it's, it's like a classic cinematographer, but he, you know, shot there will be blood. Like he's he's made a lot of the most important modern films. The Nightcrawler, you know, which is yeah, an incredibly like it, modern which is, looking movie. Absolutely. And what blew me away is that it's it's everything is gorgeous. Like everything. You pause it and you're like, oh, this is great. The lighting, the whatever. And it doesn't draw a lot of attention to itself. And then six, which I think would be that that's where I would lean, but it's a little unfair to say because it's the most recent, so that makes sense. But it's like messy, the grain is uh, a bit all over the place, they embrace it, yeah. Um, they flare the lens constantly, they let the contrast go up and down all the time. Like, there are scenes where the blacks are really black, and there are scenes where the blacks are incredibly milky, whereas yeah. four and five, it's so consistent. Whatever the look is, it's the look all the way through. And it, I kept, I had the fewest notes on four and five because it just like all was uh, like perfect without being, like it doesn't have any of that beauty lighting that one has, you know, like it, it, or it doesn't draw attention to itself. They're not throwing like a pro mist filter. They're not taking care of the women in that same classic way. It feels natural, but Hollywood natural. Whereas six is like dirty, but gorgeous dirty. Like I, that's, a, there, <laughs> th I love that. Like that's, I love that when it's messy, but gorgeous. Like that, I'm, I'm very drawn to that but was super impressed with uh, the Ellswit ones, a little intimidated. Well, what did you think <laughs> of the switch to digital for the helicopter stuff in 6? Was that noticeable to both of you guys? And did it detract, enhance? What do you think? I, I think, because that movie, I th I'm blown away by the pace of that movie. So I think if I didn't know that was well I, I guess I probably did notice it when I first saw it the it's but it's really because of the grain and the sharpness you know I definitely especially with the helicopter stuff you really you can it feels different if but I kind of you know I look for that stuff and I'm also very drawn to the dirtiness I love the grain and so digital it's one of the things that's so hard about it is like it's it's too clean for most of my tastes. Like obviously there are projects where it's more appropriate, but yeah, I, I, it didn't never bothered me, but it did. I was like, Oh, it's almost a good way of seeing the difference. Like if you want to fight for film, you can see its charms all over fallout. And then it just like loses a little, a little bit of that, that wabi sabi, that, that little messiness that, that makes it so charming <laughs> when it goes digital. It also helps to have two actors who have those, those faces yeah you know like Cruz and yeah i mean like their faces are kind of like so sharp in terms of their features as is like it actually works for the digital now if that was something like if you'd seen rebecca ferguson with that camera like how does that change the nature of the photography how someone looks uh that's really one of the things we've talked about before andy too is this the nature of how you photograph women and like how do you make the like you know like and there's that there's something about that in the series because there's great care taken the way these women are, are photographed throughout the series. But there's a certain kind of almost gravity and respect to the way Ferguson is photographed in five and six. Like they don't 
goose the photography a lot for her to make her feel long younger or anything else she has like definitive lines on her face that they just kind of let play and that's appropriate for character because she's a hard-boiled spy who's been betrayed by her country and like oftentimes like especially for big budget franchises like they don't let that the nature of character for women kind of play with them photo photographically they actually always end up embracing this old hollywood style which is like i don't care what the hell happens keep the shadows off their face and the women always have to look beautiful. And she is always beautiful, but I could tell that she's been through some shit just because of the fact that they, they don't really goose the photography in a way that I think is progressive and really respectful to her character, which is one of the reasons right. why I love, why I love Rogue Nation so much, frankly. So, um, but there's, there, there's a certain element to that where like, I, I think the the series has that kind of gravity now in terms of the digital versus film stuff. There's so much stuff we can do now to digital photography to make it approach. You're always trying to. The funny thing is, like the, the technology is brand new. It's it's the cutting edge of what what we can do photographically. But it always ends up like we we always keep going back to the same benchmark, which is to make it look more filmic, to make it look more like film. So yeah, we have incredibly sharp cameras that shoot eight K and whatever else, but we're always beating the shit out of it with with filters and lighting and flares and and, and vintage lenses to try and beat it down and make it look more classic. So. It's a, it's a, that's a, the funniest fight that I have with this. And I'm really fascinating to see where the next film goes because they are shooting on the Sony Venice and Sony cameras, at least to me, are traditionally the mo the sharpest kind of cameras in terms of like their skin tones. And, but that camera, that, that Sony Venice camera they're shooting with is a pretty remarkable camera, but I'm, I'm fascinated to see where the photography lands in the next picture. So. Yeah. What do you think about that, Andy? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very, I just finished a project that we shot on the Venice and it was my first full, I'd, I'd shot with it a little bit, but it was my first full project with it. And it's a show with it. That's, you know, a bunch of women as the leads and, uh, and I beat the hell out of that sensor. I was, you know, I had them detune I, the lenses we got. I had them detune them. So like lower the contrast, lower the sharpness, beat it up. And then I, I had a whole filtration recipe that I used to smooth out skin, take all the sharpness out. I had to talk to VFX. VFX, when they were putting in certain special effects, we have, there's like a sprinkling of it throughout the show. And they were, it's too sharp. It was too sharp. And I was like, guys, I spent so much time beating up this image, trying to take the edge off of this. Right. The VFX stand out. So we you got it like we have to beat up the VFX too. And so I'm so curious with this, especially with, you know, Cruz. I mean, he barely ages, but he does age. It's been a while. Like how <laughs> sharp will they let it be? Will they add grain is one of the things I'm the most curious about because you can do so much. But, you know, will they also do you guys know who's shooting the new one? Yeah, it's actually the guy that shot the helicopter stuff. Oh, interesting. In Fallout. He he it is his first job, I think, as a full on DP. It's his first and he's feature. The whole thing. It's his first feature. Yeah. Wow. So is it is it Fraser, Fraser Taggart? Taggart. Is yep. that his name? But he's but but he's an incredibly his resume is like remarkable in terms of second unit stuff. Mm. So he's shot basically. Yeah. Well it, we saw a bunch of footage at CinemaCon. I mean, and I don't know if it's a bunch of footage, but we saw some footage at CinemaCon, and it it looks kind of like Fallout is how I would describe it. I mean, if they have the same gaffer, so the lighting is similar. And to me, it looks like there is some grain on it. It does not look like a super clean image. It looks like it has that kind of noir kind of Fallout look yeah. to it. Yeah, I, I would even say it's... I got some sort of 80s slash 90s Cameron vibes, not in terms of the color. Yeah. There is a lot of richness. They go to Venice and they're running, you know, he's running against candles and things, but there is that kind of like the way that the camera's moving, the the use of light. Um, that's where I would put the flag, but I, who knows? I mean, we saw 180 seconds, maybe, maybe less than that. So... Yeah. Yeah. And who knows? The, and the color, you know, they're not done. So the color yeah, yeah. is one of the last things. Right. So I, they can alter right. that look plenty. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm really curious uh, w what approach they take with that whole thing. Cause it's, you know, that's a big shift and rewatching all of them. I mean, it, they are clearly shot on film. Like you can feel yeah. it. 
Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we wonder if it's um, stunt related slash maybe time related to um yeah i mean it, you know it's, i don't know look I, I don't know adrian how you feel about it but i i as much as i'd like to shoot film and i have a, you know there's a director who has a project he's like if we shoot this it's got to be film but i i get nervous about it because i feel like i can almost be more bold when shooting with some of these cameras because you you see the edges of where you're pushing right away you see it on your monitor, the way that it's photographed. And the Venice in particular has the ability to shoot in, in varying levels of light, but you can do incredible low light work. So I wonder if there's some motivation behind that. Like maybe it's, they play more with practicals. I don't know, scale down. I, I'd be very curious. Also depends on like how much night photography they have. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like if you're, I mean, like just, just, I mean, just (laughs) exactly. I mean, just the nature of shooting with the Venice you know, if you're shooting on the Venice and like, you know, you're at that, uh, Venice essentially has, you can basically use like three times less light, so to speak, in terms of what you would need to get exposure on a traditional film stock as opposed to, might even be more, might be four times. Wow. As a, and, and also traditionally, like there's been so many films that have used digital for night photography and film for day stuff mm-hmm. because these digital cameras are so much more sensitive to the low level the lower end of the of, of light so that you can for for night stuff it's a hell of a lot easier to actually get exposure and detail in your shadows with these digital cameras so a lot of productions will actually end up shooting night stuff even smaller independent films like that film 71 from a few years ago shot super 16 during the day and then they shot Amira or alexa at night because you know like uh these guy was running around in in, in ireland at night with a, without any kind of like big night sources because it, it suited their budget Obviously, Mission Impossible is the top tier in terms of what photography is, in terms of budgets and whatnot. But there's still, you know, there's one thing that is the great leveler for any kind of production is time. You only have so much time. And if someone's going to be able to work faster and cheaper, like it's going to end up winning out. I mean, I would imagine they're probably going to end up doing something like Live Grain, which is a program that algorithmically responds to shadows and highlights in photography and applies grain algorithmically so that it feels more natural and film-like. They'll probably end up doing something like that to be able to like pull the imagery closer to what's in the rest of the universe or the franchise. But we'll see. It'll be fascinating to see for sure. Yeah, I'm 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 fascinated. I it's it's it feels I mean, that's again, you know, it's another example of because now Macquarie has kind of become the director for these, but in an effort, I'm sure that was also part of the decision is like, well, we want to switch our tone. And that's a real good start you know let's not shoot film for the first time i'm sure that was a big discussion um, especially because yeah and tom cruise, cruise is, is such like a, a cinema big film talk, guy. yeah exactly right. yeah he's a huge film guy you yeah. know i mean it's, and also it's like he probably ended up doing so well i mean didn't macquarie also talk about that guys in terms of like changing his keys so that the films felt different you know yeah and uh yeah. you know like so maybe instead now that the, the chain but because it's not the same dp you know they're going to end up changing to be able to uh, affect the 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 look of the film that way. It's like they're changing the format as opposed to uh, changing everything else. But yeah. it is a big thing. They're going to keep changing keys to try and make hopefully. Maybe they don't like the idea that four and five feels so, too close together. Who knows? But yeah, I mean, I think for me, like I I kind of love the anachronism of of the of the series. I love the way one and two and three feel. So. And we're back, turning another page and light the fuse, the book of light the fuse. How, how do you feel, Charles? I feel like this is a great book. It's a page turner. It's a page turner. It really is. <laughs> you never know where we're going to go, but here we are. Yeah. And hopefully these mini episodes are uh, are leaving you wanting more and you're going to keep coming back. We've got one more part next week. Yes. We can't always give you a giant feast. Sometimes we just have to give you a little app. Just maybe a little bacon wrapped scallion or something. You know, it's not you don't you're not gonna you're not gonna fill up on it, but it'll it'll give you something tasty and edifying all the same. So that's (laughs) what these little episodes are. But you know, I wanna I wanna give you time to give your shout out too, Charles. So go ahead. Yes, I wanna give a special thank you to Jacob Ballard and Robbie J. Martin. Thank you, Jacob and Robbie. And um 
yeah, I want to uh, just tell everybody to sign up for our Patreon, patreon.com slash light the fuse. And, uh, you know, you can check out, we have bonus episodes every week, or you can sign up at the higher level and uh, you can uh, be a part of our Zoom. We're now on Zoom, our Zoom chat every month that we do. And so check out all the different levels and sign up and support the show at patreon.com slash light the fuse. Uh, and then also check out our website, light the fuse Go to the episode guide and you can see all of our old episodes. And if you've missed any, please listen to them and check out the show notes that are in there in the episode guide or head on over to the merch tab. And then uh, you can see our T public page and get linked there and buy a shirt or a magnet or a mask or whatever you want and uh, show your support for the show. That's right. And if you could follow us on social media, Light the Fuse Pod at, on Instagram and Twitter, that's always the first place that we're going to be dropping news and funny gifts and whatever else pops into our head. So please do that. Also, remember to like, subscribe, rate, and review this show wherever you are listening to it. It really helps us out a lot. And we'll be back next week for the finale. Yes, we will. And I just want to say quickly uh, that uh, this episode was edited by Luke Burson and the music was by Kevin Blumenfeld. There you go. We'll be back next week. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.